Well, thank you uh, all for coming. Really uh, appreciate uh, everything that's happening today. Um, uh, the way the comments that have been made in the past, I'm not sure that I understood who they were talking about. I, I thought they were seemed to be talking about me, but it seemed to be somebody else uh, in, in a sense. Uh, I just want to say that the, uh, uh, the people that uh, I just want to thank the our chair of uh, neurology, our chair of physiology and pharmacology, uh, who have really uh, have been wonderful in, in every way in setting this uh, affair up. Uh, and uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, so I just want to say again, uh, thank you to our chair of, uh, of, of physiology and pharmacology and neurology uh, for setting this affair up. I think we'll get right on to the uh, speakers. I'll, I'll, it'll be my pleasure uh, to introduce them. Uh, and in my prejudiced opinion, we're really lucky uh, today to have three, uh, three real superstars uh, uh, that, that, that are here today. Uh, and it's my great privilege uh, to have known all three uh, of them very, very well. Uh, the first one is Paolo Rossini. Uh, Paolo uh, came to Downstate in around 1980 or thereabouts. Uh, he stayed here for two years, uh, uh, and he was a, a, came as a fellow, essentially, uh, in our laboratory. And he's just been enormously successful uh, ever since. Uh, uh, right now, he's one of the leading, if not, in my prejudice opinion, the leading uh, neurophysiologist uh, in all of, uh, in, certainly in Italy, and, and, and in my prejudice opinion, in all of Europe. Uh, he's done extraordinary work uh, in, in, in every way, and it's just a great, great pleasure uh, for me to be able to uh, uh, introduce him. Let me just tell you a little bit about Paolo. It's written up, by the way, uh, in the handouts that, uh, that you have here. Uh, but he is uh, uh, chairman of the Department of Neurology at Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Rome. Uh, that is the most prestigious uh, university, I think, in the opinion of many uh, in all of Italy. Uh, and he's chairman of neurology there. Uh, and uh, uh, he... Uh, he's had many honors. He's published an enormous number of papers, publishing uh, well over 500 uh, papers in various journals. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, his area of interest have really been widespread uh, in, in many areas. Uh, he's been involved with transcranial electrical and magnetic stimulation of the nervous system, uh, as well as uh, uh, areas of experimental neurophysiology, clinical neurophysiology, uh, and clinical neuropharmacology. Uh, uh, he's in every way uh, one of the foremost uh, leaders uh, of neurology and neuroscience in right now in the world. He's a past president of the International Federation uh, of, clinical, of, of neuro clinical Neurophysiology, uh, which is a very prestigious uh, uh, and he, he, I think he just, you finished the presidency there last year, or you're still president there, or, or what? Of the international, uh, of the internet, hmm? So, okay. Uh, so anyway, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to uh, introduce Paolo, uh, and uh, uh, I think without any further ado, we'll let him uh, give his talk. Paolo. Good morning to everybody. Uh, at the many meetings I've been so far, I must say that this one is the only one that I, I could not miss. And I was here, uh, as Roger said, more than 30 years ago. And uh, if somebody would say to me at that time that I might have been he here today, introduce my boss and to speak in, in honor of him, I would say that uh, these people was crazy. And I will say a few words on Roger later on at the end of my presentation. So in, the last, in recent years, uh, the main topic of our interest 
uh, was on uh, brain plasticity and connectivity. But the system is not going on, it's not plastic enough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that I can check from, from here. Okay, more. Okay. <clears throat> when, when, when I was a student of your age, uh, it was told me that the brain was plastic until the age of 10 or 15 years at maximum, and then it was like frozen for the rest of the life, which actually doesn't seem to be very true, because we maintain a sort of plasticity throughout our life, and which is mainly located, as you know, at the, at the synaptic level in terms of... Uh, the more you use a certain circuit and certain synapses, you enlarge the, the postsynaptic uh, area. And if you continue to stimulate, you can e even create new connections and new synapses. But on the contrary, if you decrease the number of stimuli, you can produce a pruning of the synapses and loss of circuits. Uh, I'm pushing a lot, but OK. Uh, presently, we have several methods to test the connectivity of the brain. Uh, we have wonderful structural methods, which are mainly based on, uh, uh, on MRI. We have very good functional methods, which are mainly statistical, which are based, again, in uh, functional MRI and PET scan. But then we probably need to integrate the top two with some more dynamic types of analysis which utilize the time window of the brain. The brain is working in terms of milliseconds. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, techniques provides you a time discrimination of seconds, which for the brain is probably too long. So putting together the two things can help to discriminate a little bit better the uh, connectivity. These are w images that most of you are familiar with, with the possibility of modern techniques to, to track the, uh, the cortical to cortex connectivity or the long tracks connectivity with the different types of uh, fractionated anisotropy and types of different techniques. But uh, by using neurophysiological techniques, again, I will try to demonstrate to you that uh, you can get uh, uh, very useful information. And actually, we can use at least two different types of uh, techniques. Uh, a relatively new one is the so-called TMS-CMG, which is the one combining the transcranial magnetic simulation with simultaneous recording of the wavelets in the electroencephalographic recordings that you produce by stimulating the brain. Uh, this is actually what has been done immediately when the, um, we, the uh, TMS was introduced about 30 years ago, uh, but with no success because uh, the EEG amplifiers were too uh, um, uh, saturated by the strength of the stimulus and you could not get any real response. More recently, in mm -hmm. the late 90s, uh, um, some researchers in Finland did develop a special type of amplifier which was able to close and open very rapidly the acquisition of the signal to eliminate the saturation by the artifact and to be able to, uh, to record some wavelengths that we will see in detail later on. And therefore, if you stimulate the brain, this is the top view of the, of the head with the 19 recording sites for the routine EEG. Uh, the, the, the vertical thick line is the timing of the stimulus and the baseline before the stimulus you may see is very flat because there is no activity. These are the averages of several stimuli and then there are a number of wavelets following the stimulus in the order of few tens of milliseconds which are differently located at the different recording sites and which have a different timing that you can map out by a topographic map. And so you can follow up, actually, the, uh, the translation of the inputs from the site of stimulation that, in this case, was the, Rolandic, the left Rolandic area towards all the other recording sites. And there are a number of uh, peak 
peaks that uh, have been demonstrated in normal subjects that are present with different amplitude and latencies at the different recording sites. So TMS EG is a is a to me a powerful and very interesting type of uh, uh, of uh, technique uh, which for example has demonstrated how connectivity of the brain is changing in two very simple different physiological conditions. If you test the connectivity of the motor area during wakefulness, you will see a number of peaks and if you follow them in time and, and, and map out their topography, you will see the, the pr progressive involvement of the premotor, supplementary motor, and also the opposite hemisphere and also of the posterior parietal cortex. But if you produce the same type of simulation during non-REM sleep, for example, you, you will assist suddenly that there is a restriction of connectivity, which is physiological, because we are speaking about normal subject, uh, which is showing us that the stimulus is more or less remaining constricted to the areas of the primary and supplementary and premotor cortices. So the brain connectivity is changing time by time, is a state of the brain which is instantaneous and is modified by learning, is modified by the task which is running, is modified by the condition of the subject. And we need to know which is the connectivity when the subject is doing something and which is the connectivity when a disease is aggressing the, the brain and so on. Uh, TMS can be used to test connectivity also in another way. Uh, by using different types of repetitive types of simulation or by using different polarities of transcranial direct current simulation, you can actually produce a sort of facilitation or inhibition of the underlying neuronal pools. And if these neuronal pools are doing something within a network which is sustaining a function, you can modulate the performance within that given function of the subject. So there are a number of papers showing us that by stimulating a given node of a network, you can increase or you can decrease the reaction time, you can increase and decrease the performance in terms of recognition and so on. Another method which is more, more traditional because it's older but uh, it is becoming younger and younger uh, year after year and, and month after month is the old EEG with, with a, a sort of new type of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 analysis. Uh, when we record the EEG rhythms, for example, these are sinusoids of a given rhythm that we record from two different electrodes, we can measure the coherence, uh, which is the synchronicity of, the, uh, uh, of, of these two rhythms at these two recording electrodes. And in, in nature, you might have two different conditions, which is uh, a very high synchronicity, very high coherence, uh, like in the top case, with the number which is one, which is never reached actually in, in the normal condition. Or you may have a completely off of phase condition, which is the uh, lower one uh, um, uh, in which the uh, uh, decoherence is close to zero. So there is a, with some limitation, there is a general rule which says that whenever two groups of neurons uh, which are firing at a certain rhythm work together, th this rhythm is going, is becoming coherent for a short time. And when they stop to work together, this rhythm is getting out of coherence. So there is a continuous binding and unbinding of the natural rhythms, which tell us something about the dynamic connectivity between two or more groups of neurons. Uh, out of this, uh, it is coming out uh, a sort of uh, uh, model for the function of the brain, in which the normal brain is, is a, a, a cohort of many assemblies of neurons which are binded in a fragile way. So they can co connect and, and disconnect very rapidly. Uh, there are situations in which you have a, a pathology of the brain in which there is an excess of connectivity and there is an excess of linkage. For example, in some epileptic syndromes, in some 
uh, uh, dystonic uh, pathologies in stroke, for example, or in other conditions on the opposite in which the connectivity and the linkage between neurons is lost, is diminished, is disconnected, like in uh, Alzheimer's disease and other kind of, uh, uh, um, of, uh, of pathologies. Another type and even more recent approach is to model out uh, the brain as a sort of uh, container of, uh, uh, of uh, nodes which are the neuronal assemblies and links which are the tracks which connect the different nodes. And, and you can model out in mainly in three different models. The regular one in which you have uh, exactly the same type of connections between the different nodes. So each node has the same weight as all the others and the same types of connection. A random type in which is, there is a chaotic condition in which there is no architectural uh, rule and a small world type. And coming out from a number of experiments, it came out the, 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 the model which is most approximating the brain condition is the one called the small world, in which you may see that there are nodes which have only linkages to the approximate and adjacent nodes. There are others having linkages with the adjacent nodes and also with the remote modes and so on. This means that you have, if you have a lesion here, you have a different condition with respect if you have a lesion here, because you have less or more remote effect following a lesion. Uh, okay, by using this type of approach, the graph theory, it's called graph theory, you, you can model out uh, uh, the graph theory at the different uh, EG frequency rhythms, the traditional delta, theta, alpha 1, alpha 2, and uh, beta and gamma. And you see the connections at these different rhythms with, with one general rule in mind, that usually in an increasing connectivity of the delta rhythms, of the slow rhythms, means disconnection. So whenever a brain area is more connected in delta, this means that it's becoming isolated from the connectivity from all the others adjacent areas. On the contrary, when you have an increase for faster rhythms, like the alpha, the beta, and the theta, you have an increase of connections, an increase of translation of inputs between the connected areas. And let's see what happens, for example, during natural aging or during pathological aging of the brain. Uh, and we have on the top the LT group, the mild cognitive impairment group, which is a prodromal state between normality and Alzheimer's disease, an initial form of mild Alzheimer's disease and a moderate form of Alzheimer's disease. And you may see that uh, in the elderly, with respect to the others, you have a difference in connectivity of delta, and you have a complete progressive loss of connectivity in alpha, especially for the interhemispheric connections. So in these brains, you have a progressive increase of disconnection and a progressive loss of connections. The two things together are isolating the neuronal assemblies. They do not speak each other. They do not work to, uh, each other together. They do not cooperate anymore. And the brain is working in a much less efficient way. Uh, this was, the study they have just seen was done in a group of uh, more than 100 subjects distributed with different uh, ages. Uh, and uh, now we concentrate on what happens when you uh, move across the lifespan. Uh, and uh, these are the results. If you compare the three groups of the young, which is the blue, uh, middle age, which is uh, uh, 50 to 70, actually this uppermost age is changing according to my age. So whenever I become older, it's moving up. And then the age older than 70. And again, you may see that there is a progressive increase of connectivity in the delta so more disconnection and a progressive and significant loss of connectivity in alpha 2, so loss of connection. And this is, unfortunately, the natural condition of the aging brain, but within certain limits, everything is still perfectly normal. 
Uh, this kind of stuff uh, is, uh, uh, is, uh, um, is also reflected in the, in the path length. So these communities, as the brain is becoming older, are becoming, in certain respect, more and more restricted. They only speak with the, with the most adjacent communities, but they stop to speak with the most remote ones, okay? So, uh, uh, the young brain is usually plenty of both adjacent and, and remote connections, and the path length, in the average, is much longer than in the aging brain. The aging brain, the communities are more restricted. It's like in the real society, it's, as, it's, it's astonishing. Uh, the, the, the social relationship of the elderly people usually becomes more and more restricted with respect to when they are young. And it, it is exactly what happens to their neuronal assemblies. Uh, these are Alzheimer's patients uh, in, in which, again, uh, there is a, a small world. The definition of small worldness is a number that gives us how much small world architecture is present for that rhythm in that particular brain. And, and again, you may see that in the, in the Alzheimer's disease subject, there is a sort of flattening. There is a complete loss of this architecture. Uh, there is not more any articulation in, in, in a more flexible and more uh, um, organized way. And it is important also to see that there is a correlation between the smoldwardness in the gamma band, which is specifically the, the, the high fast frequencies of the EG connected with the high level sophisticated cognitive performances of the brain. So the, the connectivity in gamma is very nicely correlated with the performance in the memory test of the subject. So there is a, a, also a good behavioral uh, uh, um, uh, uh, counterface of, uh, of, the, of this uh, neurophysiological data. Uh, and naturally, there is also a correlation with the anatomical and structural condition, like the thickness of the cortical gray matter, uh, and, uh, 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 which is uh, highly correlated in alpha-1 and negatively correlated in, in gamma. So in general terms, the aging brain is losing volume, is losing thickness of the gray matter, is losing long-run fibers connecting different assemblies, and this is reflected also in the, in the, in the, uh, in the graph organization of the small world. Uh, this is something that uh, I, I did produce during, during the night when I had problems in, in, in sleeping, and the idea is that uh, the dynamic changes of the brain, as they are reflected in the EG rhythms, can be in some way uh, modeled like revolving doors, in which the doors are the nodes, so the neuronal assemblies, the corridors are the links that connect the different groups of neurons. And uh, you may understand that these revolving doors do have a face, so they can be synchronized each other, or they can be not well synchronized each other, and they can be selected. They can allow only the blue inputs to pass through or only the red input to pass through. So by changing the face of the rhythms, this kind of model allows you to favor or unfavor a given type of transmission or make a transmission more efficient or less efficient. Uh, few example on how can use this kind of information. Uh, for example, if you simulate the brain on the motor cortex and, and you analyze the underlying connectivity of the brain during the instant that you are stimulating, you can get some in interesting info. Uh, for someone who is doing TMS of the brain, it is a, a widespread knowledge that if you stimulate the motor cortex 100 times, you will get 100 different motor evoke potentials, different in terms of the amplitude, because the motor system is never the same. Second by second is changing in excitability. So if you simulate several times, these are the plots of the amplitude of 
the same subject in apparently stable conditions. So the stimulus is the same. The neuron navigator says you that you are always stimulating the same spot in the brain. The energy that the stimulator is delivering is always the same. But you have a, a big range of amplitude of the responses from very high, the red ones, intermediate, the white ones, and very small, the blue ones. And if you compare the two groups, so you may see that the big one is about three times larger. So there are states of the brain in which the motor system is three times more excitable than the other state. How can we distinguish between these two conditions? Can we predict when the stimulus is getting the, the system in a more excitable or in a less excitable way? Well, we can do that by, for example, analyzing the connectivity in one second immediately before the stimulus. And whenever you have this type of pattern in which you have inhibition of the connection between the motor cortex and the posterior parietal and temporal cortices and facilitation of the connectivity between the motor cortex and the premotor cortex, you will get the large responses. So the system is in a very efficient condition, in a very efficient state. On the contrary, when you don't get this kind of pattern, it's completely the reverse, you get very small MEPs. So in the, in the EEG of, of that brain is already written one second before whether the motor cortex is more or less excitable. Can we enlarge this approach to something more uh, cognitively functional? So can we see, for example, in a simple reaction time whether the subject will be performing better or uh, less good uh, by looking at the EEG connectivity in the seconds before? Uh, it can be done with the same type of approach, looking at the connectivity in the low frequency and high frequencies, and the subject is doing a simple, a simple task in which he has to push uh, the keyboard button whenever the screen is becoming green. So there is a, an alerting uh, red uh, screen, and after about a couple of seconds, uh, the subject has to, uh, has to react to the uh, incoming uh, green or not green signal. So if the green is there, he has to push. If the red is there, he has to stay. And, as usually, if you make several reaction times, you will have a group of responses which are very good, only 340 seconds of, uh, milliseconds, sorry, of reaction time, and a group of responses which are very bad. So the same subject sometimes is most efficient, sometimes is relatively efficient, sometimes is very bad, in the same condition. What is interesting is that if you separate the group of the fast responses from the group of the slower responses, again, you will see that during the fast responses there is a different approach, a different connectivity in delta, a different connectivity in alpha 1, and a different connectivity in alpha 2. So in theory, by looking at the EG connectivity in the one or two seconds before the reaction time, you can say now is going to be faster now is going to be slower. And you can ideally extend this kind of approach to many other types of applications. Uh, again, this is uh, uh, a similar type of analysis showing that you have also a lateralization because the subject was performing with the right hand. So this type of organization that I showed you was present on the left hemisphere and not present or less present in the right hemisphere. Uh, what happens when you lose connections? And there are a number of examples. Uh, one, the main one, at least for my, our interest, is uh, Alzheimer's disease and the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. For example, if you simulate the motor cortex in healthy elderly, you remain with the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, um, wavelets on the EG 
which can be mapped out with the topographic map uh, and which are represented here. But if you stimulate the Alzheimer's disease brain, you will come out with a wave which is the ATP wave, which is not present in normal controls, which is a sort of marker of the disease and is sort of marker of the disconnection and the or of alter connection. Similar approach you can do uh, following stroke. It is important for a clinician to know not only where is the lesion, but which kind of connections the lesion has interrupted. How many and which kind of connections has the lesion interrupted. And by this kind of approach you may see that all around the lesion there is a, so, a huge increase of the, of the delta uh, uh, connectivity, which means more and more loss of connections. If you compare these two types of strokes, it is clear the difference in terms of disconnections between the two. And you may have in time uh, also some reconnection for the, for the alpha-1 uh, connectivity. These are three more examples of the same message showing you the difference in delta uh, connectivity and the differences in alpha connectivity. Uh, I will terminate uh, with uh, one example in uh, epilepsy. By looking at a specific uh, uh, condition, which is the stereotaxic recordings, uh, we, we all know that uh, 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 epilepsy needs to make, uh, to recruit neurons. So the more neurons are recruited by the spreading of the, of the, of the paroxystic discharge, uh, the more is possible that uh, a crisis will come out. Uh, so if we get the recordings obtained by depth uh, needles uh, uh, during serotaxy rec recordings, in theory, we might see changes in time in the connectivity of the neurons or the neuronal assemblies around or within the focus in the minutes immediately preceding the uh, electrical or, and the clinical crisis. So the, 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 we got 10 uh, epileptic patients with stereo EG recordings, 10 minutes of uh, EEG in immediately preceding epileptic seizure, and we made the graph theory applications on the analysis of changes of connectivity for the different rhythms in the 10 minutes preceding the uh, pending uh, seizure. And it was quite clear that 10 minutes before, there were already Ch significant changes, the, 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 the red one, the, the blue one is the baseline, the red one is uh, nine minutes before, the green is six minutes, and uh, the violet is uh, uh, three minutes. So there is an increasing type of patterning of the connectivity of the, of the neurons around the, the focus, uh, which is changing already 10 minutes before. So a, an increase in delta and a loss of alpha connectivity. <coughs> the small world uh, results uh, is showing us that uh, in those subjects having a high spiking, they lose completely the small world organization in the alpha 2. Uh, with, the, uh, with the low spiking, they have a sort of a flattening, and th these are the condition of the LT subject, which is similar to the low spiking condition. Uh, these are, to me, is a wonderful example of uh, neuronal plasticity and with which I will terminate, uh, is that uh, we have seen during experiments with the robotic hand. So in other words, uh, is, uh, the subject is an amputee subject, sorry, is an amputee subject in which we did introduce uh, uh, a number of uh, microscopic electrodes in the nerves of the stump the ulnar and the median nerve. These electrodes were containing several tens of contacts, which were able to pick up the signals coming out from the motor fibers when the subject was thinking to move, and which was able also to convey electrical pulses coming from the fingertips of the artificial limb when the subject was touching something. So by using this type of approach, we were thinking to be able to restore a sort of natural loop 
of the outgoing signals controlling the robotic end and the ingoing signals coming from the robotic end. But this is not the matter of my point here now, but our matter was to see whether after several years in which the subject was deprived by the end, because this subject in particular has been amputated 10 years before, the brain was able to modify its organization following the use of the artificial limb. And that the subject was learning a number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, use of the hands, like pinching or, or taking a ball, uh, was able to recognize completely blind uh, the, the, the mildness and the, and the, and the, and the uh, texture of the subject that was touching. Uh, and so after some training, the subject was able to use the artificial hand in some respect with all the limitations of this situation, similarly to, to the natural hand. And along this way, it was clear that, for example, the motor cortex organization was changing. These are the maps of the TMS for the uh, muscle limbs proximal to the stump, proximal to the amputation side. And these maps were much larger than normal before the, the uh, use of the artificial limb, which is well known. The subject having an amputation do enlarge the representation of the remaining muscles at the expense of the loss of representation of the lost muscles in the amputated part of the limb. But after one month of training, you may see that there was a, 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 a remarkable restriction of the representation of the proximal muscles, which becomes quite overimposable to the one on the uh, normal hemisphere. And the same is for the representation of the, some EG activities, especially the ones of, uh, in, uh, after, uh, after um, the use of the, uh, frequent, of the robotic hand, uh, showing that uh, there is a change in the organization of the connections giving much more small world architecture and increasing the path length of the connections after the use of the robotic end. And finally, uh, the somatosensory potentials recorded after simulation of the nerves in the stump, which were having a very bad type of architecture. Usually, this is the architecture you have. You have a very clear dipolar organization with an intermediate passage uh, at the level of the central sulcus, which was lost before because of the amputation and was re regained after because of the plasticity of the brain in this particular subject. But now we already have done two. We are doing the third one in a few months. And uh, uh, it is clear that they regain the ability to, to fill the hand within their body scheme even after many years of, from amputation. OK, a few words on Roger. Uh, as Roger said, uh, I was here in 1980, 81, 82, and 83 for different periods each year. And uh, for me, it was an incredible experience. Uh, for, was the opening of the door of the international neurophysiology. I was a young guy coming from Italy was the possibility to meet my idols, all the big names of the neurophysiology. Some of them are sitting here in this room. And, and most important, it was a possibility for me to, to establish a long-lasting friendship with uh, Roger and with John. At that time, Roger was uh, the discoverer, I may see, of the so-called far-field potentials in SCPs which uh, were a sort of a cultural revolution. Because uh, instead of describing the shape and the latency and the topography of the signals, we started to discuss about sources, where the signals were coming from, which was a big change in mentality, uh, which became more and more mature in the following decades. And uh, my small contribution at that time was to describe a number of peaks and wavelets in, this, uh, uh, in the lower limb, uh, like in the upper limb uh, CPs. And uh, then uh, we moved to another type of uh, 
approach which was to simulate the brain. At that time, I'm speaking about uh, 1983, there was not yet a magnetic simulation. So only the electrical one was possible, but only with this type of uh, montage, which is called the bifocal, so two electrodes on the head. Uh, and to do that, uh, you needed a special simulator, which was discharging around 2,000, 2,200 volts. And believe me, it is very, very painful when you stimulate it with yourself with 2,000 volts on the head. Uh, finally, uh, here, with the contribution of uh, a physicist that was working in Downstate at that time, and Roger was sometimes coming inside the lab and say, you guys are crazy because we were stimulating with different montages. It came out that if you, if you use a, pericard, a pericranial cathode, with individual electrodes connected by bridges, so you can check and maintain the resistance uh, all around the head, and you stimulate the brain areas that you want to stimulate, uh, you can use about 10 times less amount of current. So you can reach the same result with much, much less current. We were enthusiastic about that, but unfortunately, Tony Barker, a, few, a couple of years later, came out with a magnetic simulation, which is totally painless much easier. So this remains to be, to me, a very good memory, and, uh, and, uh, and that's all. Uh, Roger teach me something that I never forgot, that you have input one and input two in the EG, or in the MG. And they are, most of the times, they are both active. When we speak about the, a neutral input, uh, it's a long story, but you have to always to think how much active is input one and how much active is input two in order to understand the final meaning of the shape that you get, which is uh, seem apparently stupid, but believe me, is not stupid at all. This is a, a very old photography. Roger, can you identify this man? <laughs> Actually, this man was John Desmet, and we were in uh, Kansas City for uh, an EMG meeting, of, I think, of the American Society. That was uh, September 84. We were both young and, and both very happy. But uh, our knowledge was increasing in, in time, especially around the table with a good glass of wine in front of us and good dish of pasta in front of us, and uh, we became friends. He saw my children grow up, so he is part of our family. Thank you. Okay, it's a tough, tough question. Uh, I think that the names of fascia is something which is benign, uh, and we all have, uh, after 18 years, let's say. <coughs> uh, but again, I think that you can 
you can reconduct that problem to, uh, to the dynamic changes of conductivity, the dynamic changes of the brain states, because probably you did remember the name of that movie five, five minutes afterward, which is quite frequent, that you insist to try to remember, you cannot, but after 10 minutes it shows up immediately. So it, it, it is the, st the, the, the state of your brain in that particular moment in which the connections for that particular memory are not optimal enough to give you the, the memory at the time you want it. Uh, and then I think that the next decades for, for them will be to study the brain as it works in the different changing states during the day and how this is damaged by a given pathology or by a given disease. This is the most exciting part of the, of the study, I think. Um, thank you very much. First of all, hi, how are you? Um, um, I, I loved your talk. Um, I think based on your early research, I started doing some research on RTMS of Alzheimer's disease, um, and what we found was stimulating um, the right and left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex at 15 hertz uh, in patients with Alzheimer's disease when coupled with PET MRI afterward, fMRI afterwards, we found that there was persistent activation six weeks after ceasing stimulation. My question is, subsequently there was data from the Maria Kofelich group and um, also from Benkwich's group in Israel um, where they found that stimulating not just the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortices, but also the parietal cortices, um, uh, produced more cognitive, positive cognitive benefits over the long term. So, A, where would you suggest stimulating uh, for, for producing maximum cognitive effects? And two, there's currently an ongoing study um, that's a multi center study using RTMS for treating Alzheimer's disease, um, where they're stimulating for six weeks, every day, five days a week. We are part of that. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> no, it, so that's, to me, perhaps difficult to, you know, it's, it's a hard study to participate. I mean, it's a hard program to participate in. So what do you feel might be, you know, more optimal, more tenable, um, frequency um, in terms of stimulation. Okay, I think, I think I actually we do participate to that study and before starting I was also as you mentioned a little bit concerning about the compliance of uh, patients and, fa and families. I must admit that they they like it and they are so motivated that they come. This, the study in general is uh, one hour treatment every day for five days a week for six weeks con consecutive, but it is done in a very different way from all the previous. The subject is doing some, performing some exercises in front of a, of a computer screen which are selectively stimulating or more or less selectively stimulating language, praxia, uh, different types of uh, visual, visual memory and so on. And the during the exercise, the TMS through a neuron navigating system is preferentially stimulating the nodes of, of that particular network. So it's a, a targeted type of stimuli, uh, which I think is the most productive type of approach. So I think that uh, in the future, uh, if this is going to uh, uh, demonstrate that it works as we really f feel, uh, this, is, this will be the type of approach, uh, having uh, together a cognitive uh, rehabilitation and targeted brain stimulation, because probably the conjunction of the two following the Hebbian rules are empowering the synapses and the connections and making them uh, more viable for longer times. So do you believe that, you know, I think in this study they're stimulating four areas, right? Yeah. 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 So Well, I like, I like the cultural type of approach. Maybe that in the future we will discover that by stimulating 
other two areas will be more, more efficient, but the, the type of approach, so the combination of the cognitive neurorehabilitation and targeted brain stimulation, I think is the, the winning one. In terms of the network, uh, how do you explain the delta activity focally? How do I explain the delta activity? The delta activity in our hands it means only one thing, disconnection, loss of connection. So the more delta activity, but not the more delta, the more connectivity in delta. So the more delta is producing delta in other places, the more this means that that particular area of the brain is separated from all the other connected in delta areas. It's difficult to say, but it's very simple. So the more you see connection in delta between a given area and other parts of the brain, this means less connection of that area with all the other parts of the brain. But, but you look into the amplitude of the cell is much larger than the amplitude of the rest of the brain. So if you've yeah, seen the very dysfunction, how you... But the, the amplitude is a, false, uh, is a false information. So mathematically, amplitude is not that important. Okay. Mm. My old friend. <laughs> Paolo, <laughs> there is a method of so-called phase amplitude coupling you look at, say, frontal delta increase in pathology, what is its effect on gamma in the posterior leads? What is effect on the gamma posterior? Yeah. Uh, well, there is not, we did not observe any regular uh, changes linking delta and gamma. But they can go in the opposite way together, or they can be completely separated and independent. Uh, so I think again that uh, the, the visual inspection of the, of the EEG is still very important, but there are a number of information that we completely miss by only uh, using the visual inspection. And that the mathematical approach can help us to extract a number of information which are completely shadowed by, by for example, by the, by the eye amplitude of the delta. the opportunity to uh, do a lot of things besides talk about science. Uh, uh, and uh, what we were able to do, we've been over to visit Palo uh, at least seven or eight times over, over the years. And each time we've been there, it's really been very wonderful. The, uh, as you know, the food is marvelous. The scenery is absolutely incredible. Uh, and the company is truly extraordinary. And I just want to thank Paolo for, uh, uh, for coming here, uh, being a fellow here for a couple of years, and for uh, allowing us to have such a close relationship uh, with him. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.